Hello, and welcome to today's session on regression. Before we begin, please make sure, as always, that you have the PowerPoint lecture notes printed and in front of you so that you can take notes along the way. Our topic of regression today will have many different subcomponents. First, we'll introduce an idea called the coefficient of determination, and we'll see how this is similar to other concepts that we've already learned. Then we'll introduce the topic of regression, and we'll give you some conceptual understanding of what goes on in regression. And then we'll speak very briefly about how we would do a regression analysis in SPSS. However, we won't spend much time on that because software packages come and go. Subsequently, we'll go into a regression of analysis inside of Excel, and we'll show you how you could manually compute a regression analysis. And then we'll conclude today's discussion with independent predictors, a concept that sets up something called multiple regression, which will actually be a topic that we'll explore in much greater depth in a later class. We will not be doing that this semester. So our first idea is to talk about the coefficient of determination. And to do that, we'll start out with a very intuitive kind of Venn diagram. Here you can see that we're looking at the variability of two different variables, x and y, and we're looking at the extent to which they overlap. Just to remind you of something that you probably recall from an earlier video, we talk about the variables that we have here with respect to this big circle that corresponds to the sum of squares. You might recall that we had measured the sum of squares or computed the sum of squares in earlier videos where we might begin by having a list of scores, for example, in Excel, and we'd find the mean for those scores. Then in the neighboring column, we would find the deviations of each of those scores from the mean. That would give us a list of deviates. We would then, in the next column, square those deviates, and we'd have a list of squared deviations from the mean. And then finally, we would sum those squared deviations, and we'd have a sum of squares. Sometimes that number is going to be relatively large. That would correspond to a relatively large circle. Other times that number can be very small. That would be a smaller circle. So we could do that for uh, any particular variable, and we could see the extent to which the variability in one of our variables is corresponding with that of another variable. And we could do this, for example, using the equals Pearson command, as we've done before in class. So in correlational research, Researchers often use the R-squared statistic, and we've talked about that before, uh, also called the coefficient of determination, to describe the proportion of Y variability explained by X. And I put explained in air quotes there because it's a little bit funny to think about uh, how we can really say that this variable is explaining that when we're merely running a correlation. Remember that correlation does not imply causation, but we, by convention, talk about the extent to which y is explaining x simply by referring to the extent to which we have overlap in their sums of squares. And this can be given by the R squared statistic, which we're also calling the, calling the coefficient of determination. So we're going to be using these terms interchangeably. The R squared value and the coefficient of determination mean exactly the same thing. You might see either of those terms in psychological literature. So let's just remind ourselves, what range of values would be possible for the coefficient of determination? Stated another way, what range of values would be possible for the R statistic, or excuse me, R squared statistic? As you might recall, the answer can be derived simply by remembering what the range of R would be. R can range from negative 1 through 0 to positive 1. And if you square the values along that range, you'll notice that the squared outcomes will range between 0 and positive 1. So the answer here is that the coefficient of determination, which is to say the R squared value, can range between 0 and 1. And by diagram here, if we had an R squared equaling 1, the two Venn diagrams or the two circles would be entirely on top of each other. On the other hand, if we had absolutely no covariation, the coefficient of determination would be 0, as would be the R squared, and there'd be no overlap whatsoever in the variability of one variable with the variability of the other variable. Okay? So let's see if we can take a practical example to maybe allow this idea to come to life. And we'll think about something that you probably described or uh, conversed about during your intro to psych classes. You probably had some conversation about the heritability of different kinds of traits. Maybe the heritability of IQ would be one of the topics that you discussed in Intro to Psychology. And we might ask questions like, what is the evidence that IQ is heritable? So there are different ways of approaching this. But one of the typical mechanisms is to look at a comparison of twins that are raised together and twins that are raised apart, and also to look at 
uh, for example, identical twins versus fraternal twins. So we'll see if we can simplify that just a little bit, and we'll take an example of twins that are reared apart. They were separated at birth, and some of these twins are going to be identical, some of them will be fraternal. Let's take the identical twin case first. Let's say that we have 100 pairs of twins that have been raised apart from each other, and all 100 of these twins are identical twins. What we might do is something like this. We'll take any given twin pair, and we'll alphabetize their, them by first name. So whoever has the earlier occurring name in the alphabet will be twin 1, and the later occurring name will be twin 2. And we'll measure their IQs, and we'll put those two scores right next to each other in an Excel spreadsheet. Then we'll go to the next pair, we'll alphabetize those folks, we'll get an IQ score for them, and we'll have twin 1 here and twin 2 right next to them, and we'll do this all the way on down the line until we've completed 100 pairs of identical twins, all of whom have been raised apart from each other. And then what we can do is highlight over those two columns in Excel and get an equals Pearson command going to give us the strength of the relationship between the IQs for all of these identical twins who have been reared apart. Okay? And then we can repeat the exercise now for, for example, uh, twins that are fraternal twins who have been reared apart. And we can ask, how strong is the correlation in IQ for identical twins reared apart? versus fraternal twins reared apart. And that might be one of the ways that we could begin to address a question about the evidence that IQ might be heritable. Okay, so let's take a look at a hypothetical data set. The R value for the IQ of identical twins reared apart might be something like 0.6. Okay, I've just made that number up. That may or may not be a realistic number, but we'll go with that. The IQ for identical twins reared apart is 0.6. So what is the value of R squared in this case? If r is equal to 0.6, we can take 0.6 times 0.6, and we wind up with 0.36. So we might say then that if this were the diagram describing the relationship between those two variables, we would have 36% of the variation accounted for in the data set. Okay? So then we can ask what proportion of the IQ is unexplained or unaccounted for by genetics, and then we might say, well, let's see. If they were entirely on top of each other, these different score sets, we would have 100% of the variability explained. Here's 0%. We had something like 36% overlap. So that would mean that 100 minus 36 gives us 64% of the variability in IQ remains unexplained by genetics. This is one of the ways that psychologists have attempted to answer questions like the heritability of IQ. Now, people will quibble with that particular methodology. This is not the place to um, have an in-depth discussion about whether that's a good or bad methodology, but you can see how you can begin to use the coefficient of determination to ask important questions about psychological phenomena like IQ and heritability. Okay, different sciences are characterized by R-squared values that are deemed impressive, okay? So it might be the case that chemists require relatively high R squared values uh, for them to be impressed that the experiment is really a meaningful experiment. My uncle is a chemist and he is not impressed by any R squared value that's going to be um, less than 0.99. He wants to see 0.99 or higher. And that's frequently the case in some physical sciences like chemistry where you can control all of the variability maybe inside of a test tube. In other kinds of sciences, including psychological science, many times we don't have complete control over the environment. So the scores become highly variable, and it's harder to explain large fractions of the variance. So in psychology, we might be used to seeing R squared values that are quite a bit more modest, closer to zero, than those that you might see in some of the physical sciences. In uh, some of the social sciences, you'll see lots of R squared values that are very, very low, very close to zero, because there are so many factors affecting social phenomena. Okay, so as we've already seen, the R squared is really the same thing as the eta squared. I mentioned that once before, but I want to introduce it here again and remind you now that we have three different terms for exactly the same concept. And those different terms are R squared, eta squared, and coefficient of determination. As you're reading psychological literature, you might see any of those terms, R squared, eta squared, coefficient of determination, they all mean exactly the same thing. And that is the proportion of variability in one variable that is accounted for by that of another variable. Basically the overlap that we have here in the Venn diagram. Okay, 
So why don't we have you stop the video now and make a note of what has been clear to this point and what has been unclear. Okay, welcome back. Now we'll begin to in introduce this idea of regression analysis. And to do so, we'll make reference to something that you're already familiar with, and that's the idea of correlation. Correlation is the process of finding a relationship between variables. We've done this many different ways throughout the semester. Using categorical variables, we've looked for associations or correlations uh, with a chi-square statistic. You might remember the chi-square test of independence. This tells us about the relationship between two categorical variables. If we're measuring our variables not on a categorical scale or nominal scale, but rather on a rank scale or ordinal scale, then we might use something called the Spearman correlation, and that again would range from negative one to positive one. And we can use this when we have these numeric variables, but now the numeric variables are indexed on this rank or ordinal scale. And then finally, if we have an interval scale or ratio scale, we can use a Pearson R statistic, which again ranges from negative one to positive one, just like the Spearman does. And we can use these now to find or describe the relationship between two variables. That's correlation, something that you're very familiar with. We're going to build on that and mention that regression is the process of finding the best fitting trend line, which might be a straight line, it might be a curved line, but the process of finding the best fitting trend that describes a relationship between variables. So in each of these cases, correlation and regression, we're looking at the relationship between variables. In correlation, we might be using something like a chi-square or an R statistic, either a Pearson or a Spearman R. And over here in regression, we're finding the best fitting trend line. It might be a straight line, it might be a curvilinear trend that we're looking for. So they're very similar to each other because they're both about finding associations between variables. Okay. The R statistic can be tested for statistical significance, and this is something that's a little bit new to us. In the beginning of the semester, we had introduced the R statistic, and we actually computed it manually. But we never tested it for statistical significance because at that point in the semester, we were not yet familiar with the concept of hypothesis testing. Now we know that we have hypotheses that start out with something like, in the population, there's no relationship between the two variables. That might be a null hypothesis for a correlation. What we can then do is test for statistical significance, and we might ask this question, what two factors determine the critical value, that's the number to beat, when we engage in hypothesis testing? One little hint here for you would be to think about the kinds of Excel commands that we've used to get the critical value. Some examples include the equals chi inv command, or the equals t inv command, or the equals f in command, what kinds of parameters, so to speak, do we put into those commands to get out the critical value? As you might recall, the two pieces of information that we need would be the criterion alpha level, that's the probability of making a type 1 error that we're willing to take, the chance that we're going to take on a type 1 error, and by convention in this class, that's always going to be 0 0.05, and that's actually the convention in most sciences. So one of the two values that we would need the two parameters that we would need would be the criterion alpha level, typically 0.05. The other would be the degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom we've computed many times before manually. Here we have it shown in this diagram. The critical value for the R statistic depends on the alpha level, for example, 0.05, and how many degrees of freedom we might have. Uh, maybe, for example, uh, the number of pairs of scores that we have in our regression analysis. A moment ago we talked about a analysis of twin IQs, and we may have had, say, 100 pairs of scores. So then our degrees of freedom would be based on those 100 pairs of scores. Okay. okay, here's the actual formula for the degrees of freedom for a regression analysis, which would be exactly the same as that for correlation. In fact, there's a very strong mathematical relationship between correlation and regression. The degrees of freedom would simply be n minus 2. Here, n stands for the number of pairs of scores. So going back to our earlier example, if we had 100 pairs of identical twins who had been reared apart from each other, we would have n equaling 100 minus 2 would give us to 98 degrees of freedom. Okay? Now, why would this be n minus 2 rather than n minus 1? The answer requires just a little bit more knowledge of degrees of freedom than we already have. Here's what we need to know about that. In general, the formula for the degrees of freedom is the number of observations minus the number of parameters that we're estimating. 
So for correlation, we have an estimate, or one estimate for the x variable. We can think of that as the twin one mean. And we have another estimate for the y variable. We can think of that as the twin two mean. So we needed to get, for example, a mean score for all the twin ones, a mean score for all the twin twos, so that we could develop the deviations and the squared deviations and the sum of the squared deviations so that we could have a sum of squares for variable x and a sum of squares for variable y. We had to estimate two parameters, two different means, one for the x condition or x variable, one for the y variable. For regression, we have one estimate for the slope and another estimate for the y-intercept. You'll recall the formula that you might have learned in 7th, 8th, or 9th grade, y equals mx plus b. This is the equation of the best-fitting straight line. You can use regression to estimate the best-fitting straight line or even curvilinear trends or trigonometric functions such as sinusoids and so forth. Today we're going to be emphasizing the y equals mx plus b equation. So we're going to need a slope and we're going to need a y-intercept. Here again, we're estimating two features or two parameters. In this case, a slope and a y-intercept. Okay? So let's say a little bit more about that. This is probably familiar to you, but just to remind you of an intuitive way to think about slope is, again, a ratio. And we said at the beginning of the class this semester that we would always be referring to ratios, ratios, ratios. Here we can think of slope as a ratio expressed as the change in the y-axis variable in the numerator and then the change in the x-axis variable in our denominator. An intuitive way to think about this is the rise over the run. Remember that our y-axis or ordinate will be rising or falling. Okay? And then we have a change in our x-axis or abscissa. And we can think of that change as being, or that ratio, excuse me, as being the slope. Okay? Here's another way of expressing that. We can think about the change in the y variable as y2 minus y1. And we can think about the change in our x variable, which is in our denominator, as x2 minus x1. So the rise on the ordinate, y2 minus y1, over the run on the abscissa, x2 minus x1. Let's make this gesticulation together. Will you do this with me? Rise, and we're going up and down the y-axis or ordinate, the rise over the run. Please do that with me along the x-axis. So we need to compute those two quantities. Here's a diagram that makes this very, very intuitive for all of us. We can have our y-axis variable here, and we can have our x-axis variable here. And we can see that if we take a particular point, here's one of the points that we might have on our scatter plot. We've made scatter plots before. It has a x1 coordinate. It has a y1 coordinate. Here's another point that we might have in our scatter plot. It too has a x coordinate and a y coordinate. We'll call that our second point. So we'll call that x2 and y2. And what we can do is look at the change in y, that's our run, that would be y2 minus y1, over the change in x, that's our run along the x-axis, x2 minus x1. So rise over run in pictures. Okay? Here the regression is linear. We have a very straight line, y equals mx plus b, but not all psychological phenomena are well described by a best-fitting line that's straight. Sometimes we get these trend lines that are very orderly, but they happen not to be straight lines. Maybe the most well-known example of this is the relationship between performance on any number of tasks and your arousal level. When you're just getting up in the morning and your arousal level is low and you're still groggy, your performance is probably going to be lowish. On the other hand, if your arousal level is extremely high and you're very nervous and you're very jittery, it's easy to make a lot of mistakes when one is jittery. In the middle, we have something of a sweet spot where our performance is maximal. So here we have a very orderly relationship and we can form a regression line, the best fitting trend. In this particular case, though, the trend would be nonlinear. It would be curvilinear. Okay? So uh, today we're going to be focusing mostly on linear trends, but I do have a one question for you. What would the equation for this nonlinear trend be? We'll let you stop the video and think about that just for a moment. Okay? As you might recall, that this might be described well by a quadratic equation, which would take the form of y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Now what's interesting is in that case you'd be making some guess about the ax squared value and the a um, bx value and the c value. So you'd actually be estimating three parameters. So if you were doing this particular kind of trend analysis 
and you were using a quadratic fit, you take the number of scores that you have, just like you did a moment ago, and you would subtract the number of parameters that you're estimating. Here you'd have one for the x squared component, one for the x component, and one for the intercept. That would give you three parameters. Your degrees of freedom would be number of scores minus three in this case. Okay, let's return now to the simpler case of linear regression. That's what we're going to spend most of our time on today. And we'll remind ourselves or develop some intuitions about how to compute the slope and the y-intercept in the simple y equals mx plus b equation. To do this, we're going to rely on some things that you already know. You've already computed in a prior session something called the sums of products, and we'll show you that formula in just a moment. The other thing that we're going to need to do is the sums of squares. We've already talked today about how to do that, and the sums of squares would be something that we've computed even from maybe the first or second week of this class. So the slope formula can be expressed this way. We're going to take the sums of products, x, y, we'll put that in our numerator over the sums of squares for the x variable. Just to develop a little bit of intuition about this, let's remind ourselves that slope is equal to rise over run the change in y over the change in x. So what we might be able to intuit from this particular formula is that this expression, SPXY, must in some way refer to how much variability there is on our y-axis. Similarly, this must refer to something about the variability that we have on the x-axis. And hopefully that's intuitive to you because earlier we talked about having either large circles or smaller circles in our Venn diagrams, and those can be thought of as how much variability that we have. Okay? Larger circles have more variability, smaller circles have less variability, and we can index the variability using the sum of squares that we've talked about a few times already today. Here's the formula that you've seen before, but not today. You saw this many, many weeks ago. If we're trying to compute the sums of products, we would do the following. We would take a particular observation. For example, we might take twin one's IQ and subtract that or subtract from that the mean IQ for all the twin ones that we have in our Excel spreadsheet. Similarly, we can take y, a y score, which might be the twin two score that we have in a particular pair, and we subtract from that the twin two mean, and we get these deviates, a deviate for twin one, a deviate for twin two, and we multiply those two together, and we get a product. And then we do the, next, uh, the same thing for the next pair of twins, and the next pair of twins, and the next pair of twins. And eventually we sum up all of those deviation scores, and we wind up with a sum of products. Okay? And that becomes the numerator in our slope formula over the run on our x-axis. The intercept is really quite easy to compute. All we need is the y-mean, the mean from our y-axis variable, and we'll now subtract from that the quantity of the slope that we've just computed times the x-mean. So what's really driving this is the mean values for y and x and the slope that we've just computed. So the uh, intercept is easy to compute as well. Okay, so that's how we would manually compute uh, any particular slope, and it's taking advantage of the sums of products as well as the SSX value. Okay, why don't we let you stop the video now, and you can proceed to return to the video when you're ready. Okay, welcome back. In the next section, which I'm going to skip over largely because uh, there are some details here about the SPSS software that might come and go. So uh, some of the details about what we click on might be true contemporarily, but with the next version of SPSS, it could very well not be true. Just very briefly, we will go in and use the Analyze menu. There's a Regression submenu, and we can slide the different variables into the Regression submenu. What's important here is that whether we're using SPSS or some other kind of software, frequently we get as output this kind of coefficients box. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time on this because whether we're using SPSS or not, we'd like to be able to understand how to pull information out of a software package in order to develop a few different things. We want to get the equation for the best fitting line. We'd also like to get the R statistic. We'd also like to be able to determine whether the R statistic is significant or not. Okay, so the coefficient section, in this case in SPSS, might look something like this. You might notice that we have a model section, an unstandardized coefficient section, a standardized coefficient section. They even give us information on a t-test, which we will not need, although there is a formal mathematical similarity between a t-test and an r-test that we could talk about in an upper-level course. Finally, we get the sig value, and we've looked at sig values many times before. These are also called p-values, and they refer to the probability of a type 1 error. 
Okay, so let's see what we can pull out of the coefficient section for a regression equation. And here we're going to develop the example where we might be regressing the uh, extent to or the salary that we're earning on the education level that we have. Many students are wondering after they've invested all this time in education, will it pay off in terms of salary? So we can run a simple regression analysis to find the best fitting line that relates these two variables to each other. We're trying to predict a criterion variable of salary using a predictor variable on the x-axis of your education level. So let's say that we had done this inside of SPSS. This might be what our output looks like. Okay, let's see what we can pull out of this. First, if we're trying to get the regression equation, y equals mx plus b, we're going to need a few pieces of information, including the y-intercept. In the SPSS output, we can always go to the first line, which will be labeled as constant, and there's going to be some constant value in the unstandardized coefficients box. In this particular case, it's minus 9,923.665. That value, shown here in the unstandardized coefficients on the constant line will be the b in y equals mx plus b. This is the y-intercept. So as we begin to build this equation, we can extract that number for our y-intercept. So here, b is equal to minus 9,923.665. We also need the m, or the slope. Where does that come from? Well, on the line down here, we have our predictor variable. In this case, it's the education variable that we're using to predict the criterion, which is the salary. We can now pull out that unstandardized coefficient and we get 1,807.836. So that becomes the m in our y equals mx plus b equation. Okay, and then if we put some of those together, you can see that we have y, which in this case is going to be the salary level, is predicted by this value times the x, the level of education that you have, minus some constant value that comes from here. So simply stated, the two parameters that we need to develop a y equals mx plus b equation, which is to say a linear equation, come from the unstandardized coefficients. The constant is the b value here, and then the coefficient for the education variable, our predictor variable, is shown on the second line. And this gives us the regression equation. Okay, we can also pull from this box the R statistic itself, the standardized beta coefficient, this is R, not R squared. In this case, the R value is 0.705. So what we would say then is that we might have a correlation between this predictor variable of education and the salary that has a value of 0.705. We could square that into a first approximation. It would be 0.7 times 0.7 or approximately 0.49 uh, would be our R squared value. And lastly, what we can do is come all the way over here to the sig value for the variable of interest. And that sig value is going to be 0 0.000 in this case, which is to say less than one chance in a thousand. And that's going to be a statistically significant sig value. So we could reject the null hypothesis. Again, in this case, the null hypothesis might be something as simple as in the population, there's no correlation between one's education level and one's salary. Here we have a relatively strong R value, one that's not likely to have occurred by chance. In fact, an R value this strong could not have occurred by chance in one time in a thousand. It would be less than one in a thousand. So there's a significant positive correlation, and we've already talked about the coordinates of the best fitting line. Okay, so we're going to wind up rejecting the null hypothesis in this case. Okay, <clears throat> why don't we then go ahead and look at regression analysis inside of uh, Excel, and what we would have to do here inside of Excel if we're going to perform this function of finding the best fitting line. First, let's remind ourselves that correlation and regression are very similar to each other. They're all about describing the associations between variables. If we have a significant correlation, the best fitting regression line is said to have a slope significantly different from zero. Sometimes it is stated this way, the slope departs significantly from zero. So you can think about a line that's flat as a pancake, it has a zero slope, and then maybe it's tilted a little bit this way or a little bit that way. How much tilt would we need to say that we have a slope that's significantly different from zero? That's the question that we're asking here. What we need to note is the following. A slope can be very modestly different from zero, just tilted ever so slightly away from zero, and still be statistically significant if all data points fall very close to that line. In correlation and regression, statistical significance is determined by the strength of the correlation between two variables 
in the R value and not the apparent slope of the regression line. The significance of the R value, as always, depends on the alpha level and the degrees of freedom, as we've seen a moment ago. Here, I'd like to take a moment and break out of PowerPoint and try to make some of this verbiage a little bit clearer to you and give you some intuition about what's going on here. So let's break out of this. And take a look at some hypothetical data sets. We'll use the example that we used a moment ago when we had computed the regression analysis for the relationship between education level as our predictor variable and our criterion variable, which was salary. And here I've got two hypothetical plots. In this particular case, I've got salary shown as a function of education, and you might see a relatively strong slope, but I also hope you'll notice that there's a pretty good circular cloud of dots here. So the cloud of dots is not perfectly circular. It's a little bit on the elliptical side with an upward slope to it, as you might see. But notice how much scatter there is. In this particular case, we might, hypothetically, have an R value that might be something like 0.28. And it might turn out that is a non-significant R value. And if it is, we would say that this slope is not significantly different from zero. Why? Because the R value is not a significant R value. Let's now contrast that with a different picture. Same variables, salary, is plotted as a function of education. Again, education is the predictor variable. That's the terminology that we use. Salary is our criterion variable. That's the terminology that we use. Here, you might see that this slope looks more modest than this slope. But there's a critical feature here that I hope you can see. And that is that all of these points very tightly adhere to that best fitting line. The line itself isn't very steep. It's only slightly greater than zero. And yet, because all of the points are so close to it, we wind up with a very impressive R statistic. Here, the R is 0.74, as contrasted with the 0.28 that we had a moment ago. Because this R value is so strong, it might turn out to be statistically significant. And if it is, then we could say that this slope is statistically greater than zero. It is reliably or statistically greater than a flat slope, which would be a zero slope. Now, this can be a little bit counterintuitive. I'm actually offering you an example that's one that doesn't come up very often, but it does come up occasionally. And what you'll notice here is that even though this is a modest slope compared to that one, every point is right on the line or just barely off. Over here, we have considerable scatter in our elliptical cloud around that best fitting line. So to wrap that all up, here we have a significant slope. It departs significantly from zero because of its high R value. Here we have an apparently steep slope, but it is not significantly different from zero because of its relatively modest R value. So the R value is steering the ship. Okay, let's go back to our regularly scheduled program. Okay. And we'll remind you that if we do want to determine whether a particular R value is significant or not, we'll, we'll need to be looking at some kind of a chart like this. Sadly, at the point of this video recording, there is no equals rinv command inside of Excel. There's an equals tinv command, or a chiinv command, or an finv command. In principle, the programmers at Excel could have given us the R increment. They haven't yet done so. So if we want to determine whether we have a statistically significant R value, which would help us understand whether the slope of our regression line is statistically significant or not, we'll have to do it the old-fashioned way. We'll have to go to a, a chart that contains the critical values, the values that we would have to beat in order to determine whether we have a significant slope or not. Okay. Remember, the regression line can help us predict one score based on another score. And the terminology that we might use for the regression line might be something like this. The regression line accounts for, or perhaps explains, some fraction of the variability in the scores. And that fraction will be corresponding to the R squared value. So it might be, for example, that we have a 0.7 correlation between education level and salary. If we square the 0.7, we might get something like 0.49, and we would say that this best fitting line explains 49% of the variability in salary. Right? To explain or to account for, again, does not mean that we have a causal relationship. This is simply the terminology that many different sciences, including the science of psychology, have adopted. We want to emphasize, as always, that correlation does not imply causation. A synonym for regression is prediction. 
Okay, so correlation and regression are very similar to each other. We use regression for prediction, and you might recall that regression, uh, excuse me, the prediction is one of the four goals of the scientific method. Do you remember what the other three are? In fact, maybe you can call off all four of them. We'll give you a moment to see if you can do that. Okay, so from the most rudimentary of the goals, we'll start out with description, and then after we have description, we hope that we can go up to prediction. And today's conversation has been about how we predict using these best-fitting trend lines. Regression helps us with prediction. Beyond that, we also talked about explanation. This is trying to understand causal relationships. And earlier this semester, we talked about the importance of experiments, where we can have tightly controlled conditions, randomized groups, and we can have experimental manipulations to get to causation. And hopefully, once we understand causation, we can begin to apply what we've learned to solve real-world problems in the application level, the final and fourth goal, of our four goals in the scientific method. A significant correlation implies a significant capacity for prediction, prediction that is reliably better than chance. We're hoping that we can use an x-axis score to make a better than chance prediction about a y-axis value. Okay. Once again, here are the different components of the y equals mx plus b equation. Our criterion variable might be something like salary, will be predicted based on the slope times the predictor, plus the intercept, okay? y equals mx plus b. Okay, we'll now go on to our final section, and we'll give you an introduction to something called independent predictors. Here we're going to be introducing this idea of having more than one predictor. And we'll start out just by reminding you that to this point in the video, we've only attempted to use regression uh, for prediction using one predictor at a time. We used education, for example, to predict salary. But as you'll recall from our conversation in factorial experiments, we know that many different factors will influence the outcome uh, that we might be interested in. And so we have these factorial designs uh, that we can use, or that can, can be analyzed using something like a complex ANOVA or a factorial ANOVA. We have something like that in the world of regression as well. And this is the idea of multiple regression. Before we get into that, we'll just remind you that we've tried to predict one variable called y, our criterion, using just one variable, um, the, the singular predictor that we've had on the x-axis. In multiple regression, this is the process by which one variable, y, called the criterion as always, is predicted on the basis of more than one variable. So instead of just having the x variable, we now have, if you will, an x1, an x2, an x3, and so forth. So here's the simple case. This is what we've looked at so far, where we have one predictor variable, one criterion variable. What we want to get to is the case where we can look at how much overlap there might be, not just between these two variables, but by more variables by introducing additional predictors. So let's see if we can begin to set the stage for that by taking a particular case. One more example for today is relating to the admissions process at any college. Here at Denison, we try to determine who's going to be successful by looking at a number of predictors. And one of our predictors might be something like your high school GPA. And we might use that to try to predict your estimated GPA here at Denison at college. Okay? And maybe there's some overlap between those two. Okay? What we can do then is try to introduce a second predictor and say, well, in addition to using your high school GPA, might we have some other predictive variable? And that might be something like your scores on a standardized test maybe like an SAT test, maybe an ACT, that kind of standardized test might give us some insight as to what you'll be able to do here at Denison with respect to your Denison College GPA. Notice that the red circle and the blue circle have maybe something like a 25% overlap. Similarly, this dotted green circle and the blue circle have about a 25% overlap. So these two variables are, are basically corresponding with the criterion variable in this hypothetical, your college GPA, about equally well. Unfortunately, x1 and x2 provide some redundant information about y, so the predictive increase is relatively small. And you can see that the redundant information is shown here in this gray area. This is the portion of the sums of squares that's shared by all three of these variables. So when we added this second predictor, we got some redundancy. But the good news is we also got some unique predictive power right over here. The area that overlaps between green and blue that is not also shared by the red region. And down here we have some unique contribution that's made by x1 that is not also shared by x2. 
Okay? So we have to be aware of how much redundancy we have in our predictors. And every once in a while, we can find a predictor variable that has no redundancy with any of the other predictors. Here, we're showing that schematically by what I'm calling variable 3. This might be something like letters of recommendation that tell us about your conscientiousness. So we can have conscientiousness predicting your college GPA. We can also have board scores like SATs, ACTs. And we can also have something like your high school GPA. These are three different predictor variables. We now have multiple predictors still working on this one criterion. In this particular case, it would be your college GPA. So what we can say here is variable 3 has no overlap with either x1 or x2, so it would add the most new information. It doesn't have any redundancy whatsoever. In short, since all three predictors provide some unique information, predictions would be best when using all three of these. Remember, the best predictions are the ones that give us the most covariation. And by using all three of these, we're covering a lot of the area inside of the blue circle, which would be the college GPA in this particular case. Here's an interesting question. If you want it to be more parsimonious, and by parsimonious we mean economical, or if you wanted a simpler kind of prediction, rather than using all three of these, let's say that you wanted to pick just two. Okay? So you're using two predictive uh, components rather than three. That's a simpler model, a simpler predictive model. Which two would you pick and why? Well, let you think about that just for a moment. Okay, hopefully you came to this conclusion. The first thing you would do is you would predict, you would pick x3 as your variable. This has the uh, un unique prediction with this blue area. There's no redundancy there. And then what you would do is pick somewhat arbitrarily either the red one or the green one as your second variable because these red and green ones have some redundancy. You wouldn't pick just the red and the green excluding the purple. Right, because the green and the red have so much redundancy that you're not buying a lot of new information. So if you could pick only two, you would start out with this one, which has no redundancy, and uh, you would pick either of the other two. Again, the reason for that is largely driven by any one of these alone has maybe a 25% or so overlap with the criterion variable, but this one provides lots of unique information, either of these two less so. Okay, so that was a conceptual introduction to this idea of multiple regression, and we won't be doing the actual computations for multiple regression in uh, this semester, but if you take an advanced course, you'll see that we can get into those computations, and you'll see that there's some formal similarities between having multiple predictors and having multiple independent variables, as we had done in our factorial analyses very recently. So we're at the end of today's video. Thank you for staying with it. I hope you'll make a note of what has been very clear, and also what's been unclear, and I look forward to hearing your questions and comments in class. See you in class.